How did we Americans get so lucky? How did we defy history and produce America's great treasure of freedoms that many take for granted today? Our special guest is well-known news anchor, reporter, and talk show host, Fred Lacaze. He is going to tell us some things we may have forgotten or even never learned about the founding of America, how our democratic republic was born, and how our unique values and individual rights have given hope to mankind. Stay tuned. Welcome to The Better Part, a program by and for seniors and devoted to exploring the many facets of those better years of our lives. The name of our program was inspired by a quotation from Robert Browning. Grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Mr. Lacoste, thank you so much for your visit to give us some insight into our American history. Thank you, my pleasure, Marilyn, so make, make mine Fred, okay? All right, <laughs> thank you. Sure. Um, you've been giving some very exciting speeches in schools and organizations about our early democratic republic. And I like the fact that the subject is being covered with an eye of a reporter. Mm -hmm. How, what caused you to get involved in this endeavor? Well, this was back, oh golly, six or seven years ago. And I was up in Oregon visiting my son and his wife and <clears throat> their three daughters, my three granddaughters. See? And I asked them during the course of the, the visit there, uh, tell me what some of your classes are and what you're learning, well, especially about early U.S. history, you know, how, the, how America was founded and the Revolutionary War and the Constitution and all that. And it kind of, shoom went over their heads and I thought, huh? Because these were pretty good students, still are. Uh, then they were like third grade, eighth grade, eleventh grade. And that bothered me. So I thought, I'm going to do some research here. So I started investigating the various curricular frameworks from school districts and various states around the country. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that there has been a narrowing down of teaching that portion of our American mm -hmm. history, that time of the Revolutionary War, etc. And that bothered me. Plus there's been a narrowing down in, in terms of teaching basic civics that most of us had when we were seniors mm -hmm. in high school. A lot of school districts have not, not kept up that, that momentum, if you will, so kids understand what's expected of them when they become adults. So that bothered me. So I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? Well, I was sort of semi-retired from my business and television. So I started reading a lot of the great biographies that have been written about our founding fathers the past dozen to 15 years. A lot of great ones, by the way. And the more I read, you know, the old adage, the less I knew, so the more I studied. And I spent about two years studying. And I finally thought, I know, I'm going to come up with a presentation for school assemblies. Why not? Or classes. And so I did. I got 35 minutes worth about uh, the history. And then the last 10 minutes, teaching kids about what they should do once they become adults and can vote. And that's really how I got started in this thing. And what I did is I hired, well, I conned about 10 of my close friends to do, actually do the voices of our founding fathers, including my wife, Terry Lowry, who does a mean Abigail Adams, oh. I must admit. And then I put together this presentation, and I've given it now over 100 times in schools and conventions and service clubs, and I'm really enjoying it. To set the stage uh, for the revolution, sure. would you tell us um, what it was like, uh, the people here prior to the revolution? Actually, most of them were Brits, about 85 to 90 percent of them. Some from France, Spain, uh, the Netherlands, Norway, but 85 to 90 percent of them were Brits. And now we're talking about 150 years here, too, before the revolution. 1607, Jamestown, the first English colony in America that survived, all the way up to the French-Indian War, and that was 1756 to 63. And they wanted to leave England because they wanted to upgrade themselves. And there was quite a strata existing in England at the time. It's hard to move mm -hmm. up a notch or two. So to do better, they thought, well, what the heck, let's take a chance. Let's take whatever money we have and they were risk takers. They had to be because they didn't know if they were going to make it all the way across the Atlantic, let alone survive the first year. And they did, however, and they really worked. And once they got here, wow, they saw all this land, farmland, wonderful. Because in, in Europe and Northern Europe and England, they didn't have much farmland. So they started their own farms and they prospered. Ninety percent of them, in fact, those 150 years were farmers. And they set up mm -hmm. their own local governments 
and they took great pride in setting up those town hall meetings in which they could control what was really going on around them. They didn't like the idea of the governor appointed by the king, of course, and each of the 13 colonies to rule them, but they were smart. They allowed us to set up armed governments, and we did. So that gives you an idea of roughly who we were at the time, primarily Brits. Well, if life was better for them over here, yeah. why then would they rebel against the greatest power in the world, the King of England? Yeah, indeed, he was, indeed. Uh, you know, actually at about 1750, roughly in that area, er, era, about halfway through the 1700s, there was a growing sense of independence. Uh, we were still loyal to the king, but we liked the idea of maybe not being called property of the king. Let's give us a little more independence. And then came the French-Indian War, 1756 to 63. We actually fought alongside the Brits against the French and the Indians. So in 1763, you know, we felt pretty good about this. And then the Brits had a major deficit problem, <laughs> much like we have today in America, as a matter of fact. And they had to figure out what to do about it. Ah, we'll tax those colonists, and did they ever. They put fees on almost everything you could think of. And then they came out with a Stamp Act in 1764-65. The Stamp Act was imposed by Britain, and everything written or printed here in America, wills and ads and newspapers, whatever, playing cards, even dice had to be stamped and therefore taxed. Mm. Well, that didn't make most of us very happy. And good old Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty, they're the ones who really started rebelling and established those boycotts of British goods. And then they came out with that great slogan, taxation without representation. And that's what really got us going in terms of our rebellion. Who were the people who actually favored and engineered the revolution? Uh, well, we have literally thousands of them who never became famous. These are the hard-working people day in and day out. But there were some certain catalysts, of course, that did, did lead us, if you will. Sam Adams w was one of them, you know, with the Sons of Liberty. And they're the ones who in the greater Boston area, uh, again, led those boycotts against British goods. So Sam was a key catalyst, if you will. And in fact, it was, that would have been 17, what, 73, January. He and the boys led the Boston Tea Party, <laughs> and they dumped those you know, tens of thousands of pounds of tea into Boston Harbor. So Sam was a great one. Uh, another catalyst was John Adams, his cousin, great lawyer, living just south of Boston, of course, also a representative in our constitutional governments and legislatures, uh, also directly involved in the Declaration of Independence, naturally, in that particular committee. So uh, Sam, let's see, make sure I don't forget. Oh, Thomas Paine, yes. Paine was a Brit. He'd only been in America about a year and a half, had a wonderful British accent, of course, and, and he's the one who wrote Common Sense. Mm -hmm. And it's, it established many of the arguments that encouraged a lot of people, oh, yes, we do deserve our independence. So Paine was a catalyst himself. Uh, Patrick Henry, of course, gave that famous speech, didn't he, in the House of Burgesses, give me liberty or give me death. He was a good one, a major catalyst, too. Uh, Jefferson himself. Tom Jeff, younger guy, he was from Virginia at the time, also a representative, and then got directly involved, as we all know, in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, ben Franklin was a catalyst also. Ben was quite an author, writer, journalist, wrote many columns in which he encouraged us to think more independently. And, and in fact, Ben also wrote the first draft of the Articles of Confederation, 1774, and they sort of became a guide for us, if you will, to try to unite us a little bit. He was quite a catalyst himself. And then finally, George Washington who was the inspiration for most of us. Great general, and in fact became our commanding general then in June of 75 outside Boston and Cambridge. So those are just a few of the catalysts who really became famous as helping us finally move into our rebellion, our revolution against the English. Well, the Declaration of Independence, to me, it's a masterpiece of writing. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Um, why did they need a written document, and who did it? Who? Why did they? Well, let's, for, well, let me explain how the process, how that worked. There was, uh, Congress appointed a committee of five because they said, we need to tell the world, everybody, we need to tell our own colonists. We need to tell the British why we're rebelling, all right? So they had a committee of, let's see, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, a guy by the name of Ben Franklin, John Adams, and this new kid on the block, T.J. Thomas Jefferson from, from Virginia, say. and they thought, aha, it'll have more impact on the king and the parliament and everybody else in the world 
if the writer is from Virginia, because it was very highly respected as a colony. And they knew that T.J. could also write pretty well, so they gave him the assignment. Well, what he did then is, in three weeks, <laughs> on the second floor of a house that was rented then on the outskirts of, of Philly, Philadelphia, Jefferson knew that there were certain things they wanted to accomplish. First of all, they wanted to convince everybody that, yes, we are all created equal. That was extremely important. He also wanted to point out the abuses of the king. So what he did is that he, he didn't create all this stuff. He borrowed it, but he was a smart student. And he took George Mason's Virginia Declaration, as a matter of fact, which he only had written about two months before that. He took a lot of his ideas. He took a lot of the ideas from the 74 convention, of the Congressional Convention, and because they had discussed the possibility of how we rebel and how we declare our independence. And then he, he also borrowed from Plato, Socrates, uh, Cicero, who would discuss some of the problems they had with the Greek democracy, of course, which then was like 2,200 years before that one. And finally, he got his draft done. And you know what happened? Congress and the committee made 86 edits. And that infuriated Jefferson, who was very proud of his own writing. And then they chopped off a, a, chopped off a quarter of his original draft, especially that portion where he called the king a tyrant. A little too <laughs> harsh, they felt. And finally, though, Jefferson, okay, I'll go along with the game if you're going to make all those cuts. So in essence, he was really the writer, if you will, of the Declaration of Independence with a lot of edits and a lot of help from other researchers. And there's your answer. Well, they were brilliant people. Oh, indeed. They were well educated. That's yes, indeed. Certainly. Well, they were daring and brave people yeah. to do something sure like were. that. Now, what, and I know a lot of them were financing, putting up money and different things. What was the fate of these early uh, instigators and, and leaders? Oh, especially the ones who signed the Declaration. Yes. Wow. Uh -huh. There were 56 of them, 56 men. Mm -hmm. These guys were all pretty well to do. And uh, they, a lot of them were lawyers, very well educated, uh, many merchants, uh, a lot of farmers, very wealthy farmers. They had plantations and, and depending on which historian you want to believe, because there are a lot of history has been written about their fates, if you will. Mm -hmm. Some perhaps were glorified a little too much. But overall, some of them were caught by the British, captured, tortured, killed. Some of them escaped into the mountains, came back and fought during the war. Some of them lost their, proper, their entire properties, their farms, their mansions, what have you. Some of them had their, their wives and their kids killed or else chased away. So, but the king and the parliament said, you've committed treason. And therefore, according to the king and parliament, those fates were justified. Mm. Well, they had to have a war then. <laughs> and... Um, Yep. We had 13 very separate and distinct colonies, sure did. almost like yes. nations. And how did they all unite to make a war against the British? Whew. Boy, I tell you, that wasn't easy. Because you're right, we were fighting each other all the time. Constant battles between the colonies. But then again, Ben Franklin, as I mentioned, wrote that original draft of the Articles of Confederation. That was in 74. The war started April 75. Declaration of Independence, 76. Slowly, that Articles of Confederation was used to unite us primarily just to get money, to pay our soldiers, mm -hmm. and to give them ammunition, you know, and goods, whatever they needed. But that's about all they got out of it because all those Articles of, of Confederation created was a legislative branch, no executive branch, no judiciary. So it really wasn't a very good unity, if you will, among all of our nations, except for Doe. One thing united all of us, and that was a common enemy. You had the British soldiers, you had the king, and the parliament, and that was enough to unite us. If we read history, it looks like we lost most of the battles against the British. <laughs> how, how did we ever win the war? Good question. I'm, I'm still amazed. After reading a heck of a lot about those battles, uh, I'm amazed that we won. Actually, I, you know, I think the majority of the battles were lost by both sides. Nobody came out a winner in most of those battles because we lost so many men. So many of them were, were injured and wounded and disabled for life. And overall, I think I'll agree with most historians that, that the British probably won more battles than we did, seriously. But we did have a lot of things going for us. We had the grit, the genius of George Washington. Uh, we were fighting on our own home turf for liberty. Um, we knew our territory. We knew where to get manpower, where to get food, 
that sort of thing. And the Brits invariably, whenever they moved off the coastline inland, they ran into all kinds of logistical problems. I mean, they had an awful time. And, and uh, as a result, by the way, they didn't have enough soldiers to fight in all 13 colonies and then occupy all 13 colonies. Mm. So that was a major mm. problem for them. And then, let's see, what happened down the line? Oh, yes. Finally, in, in 81, 1781, what happened? Almost 8,000 British troops under General Cornwallis s surrendered. And that was an interesting turning point because with that, the king lost control of Parliament and the support of Parliament. And then it was all downhill for the Brits after that. Finally, in 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed and we had won our independence. And it's amazing that we did, but we won the Revolutionary War. Then we had to make a nation. We had to make a republic. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was the quotation by Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> You have a republic? Yeah. See if you can keep it. Oh, indeed. <laughs> now, how did all these, again, these 13 <laughs> very independent colonies uh, with somewhat different philosophies in some respects, yeah. how did they come together and unite then to make our nation? <laughs> that was not easy. You're right. We were fighting each other over land and slaves and, and boundaries, etc. Articles of Confederation that Sam, or pardon me, that Ben had written, I mean, there wasn't a government there that really would unite all of us. So that was difficult. We were on the verge of anarchy. Most of the people, by the way, who had fought in the war were now deeply in debt, and they wanted nothing to do with the next colony. They just wanted to survive themselves and somehow help their families survive. And it didn't look good. And here we were. We had won the war. And now what the devil do we do? You're right. Ben Franklin coined it. You have a republic if you can keep it. No. Ah. Then along came two guys, James Madison. He was a young scholar from Virginia, all five feet four, 100 pounds of him, dripping wet, I think. You know. mm. But he was a, a marvelous scholar. And then he and Alexander Hamilton, the, the lawyer from New York City. By the way, his average closing argument was about 10, 12, 14 hours. He put more, more juries to sleep, but he was brilliant. He didn't know when to stop. He just went on and on. Those two got some of their fellow, you know, organizers together, if you will, representatives, and said, uh, let's, uh, let's convince Congress that we should appoint a delegates to a special convention, presumably, to revise the old Articles of Confederation. <laughs> Those guys pulled a fast one because they had no intent of trying to revise the Articles. They knew it was worthless. So they thought, we'll just throw it out and start all over. So the Congress appointed all these delegates, presumably, to revise the old articles. Yeah, it didn't work. Madison had already written a document, and I forget what it was called now, but it was the Virginia Foundation or something like that. And, um, and he decided that this will become the framework for a new U.S. Constitution. And hey, this, that looked pretty good for a while. And then we started arguing. You had eight northern states totally opposed to slavery. You had five southern states adamantly in favor of sustaining slavery. How are you going to resolve that? Wasn't easy, okay? You had the North and the South fighting. You had also Federalists versus non-Federalists. Those Federalists, like Hamilton, they wanted a big central government with a president who was really strong in power, see, and a strong Congress to control all those colonies. <laughs> then you also had people like Patrick Henry, T.J., Thomas Jefferson, and some of the folks from the South who said, no, 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 we are non-federalists. We want the states to remain more power, with more power than the federal government. Well, this went on for a couple of years, making no headline, I mean, no headway whatsoever. Finally, what happened is that somebody said, you know, I think what we have to do, the only way we're going to pass this Constitution is if we come up with a national Bill of Rights. Oh, okay. So they encouraged the states to send their recommendations for the National Bill of Rights down to James Madison, the scholar. He took 200 of these recommended amendments, consolidated them down into groups, got them down into 19 recommendments that would, that would make up our National Bill of Rights, sent those 19 to Congress. Congress chopped off seven of them, sent 12 to the states. The states ratified 10 of those recommended amendments, and those, of course, became our National Bill of Rights. And with that, finally, 
the Constitution was approved, we had a Bill of Rights, and we had a United States of America. Amazing, but we pulled it off. Based upon what they knew at that time yeah. and the way life was, it had some flaws, and huh. uh, some of them were pertaining to oh. slavery and women's rights and so in, forth. Indeed. And, uh, oh, especially, well, slavery. We thought we'd compromised. In fact, slavery at the time, though, see, was not unusual. Everybody mm -hmm. is so critical right. of Jefferson and those boys. Well, that's the way it had been throughout history. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, all civilizations had had slaves throughout their, their lifetimes, if you will. So it was not unusual. And, but we knew that the South wanted to maintain slavery. Those eight northern states totally opposed to it. Now, how in the devil do we resolve this? All right? John Adams was adamant against those in the South. Jefferson said himself, he said, I have slaves, and, and there's no way we can free them now. They need to be educated. They need to be taken care of for at least another generation until they can be educated. So at least Jefferson was empathetic, if you will. But still, you couldn't get the states together at all. And what, did, what they came up with finally is called the Three-Fifths Compromise. They decided that the southern states could count only three-fifths of their slaves as being part of the state's total population. Hmm. Well, everybody kind of thought, that's, that's cool. That'll equalize power, if you will. And then the North said, okay, if you're going to have that, if we're going to grant you that, we're also going to make sure that you end slave trade within 20 years. Hmm. So the North thought, well, at least we can get rid of slave trade. And the South said, oh, we'll see about that. So they compromised. Yeah. But we know what happened. The South, no way. They imposed all kinds of rules that prevented those slaves from being free, didn't they, in the South? Mm -hmm. And it would take another three generations before the Civil War, which was not totally, but largely fought over slavery, you know, and, and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment in the 1860s finally gave freedom and independence and the right to vote to slaves. And that didn't work, did it? Because the South once again imposed other rules, and it took another 100 years after that for the civil rights movement and the legislation of the 1950s and 60s before those descendants of our African-American slaves would finally gain their voting rights and their independence. So that was one that we really struggled with. Now, the other one you mentioned, women's rights. Oh, nothing happened there for a long time. I mean, Abigail tried. Oh, she wrote some rather <coughs> tough letters to her husband, John, and whew, was, uh, was very upset with him. But, of course, John knew that he had all other men on his side, and so no way were women going to gain any rights at all. In the early 1800s, though, it was interesting. There were some women who had money, and they would start colleges, little colleges throughout the East Coast. And finally, that gave women at least a little more education. That was the 1850s or so. That's when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and help me out, I can't remember the other one's name. Oh, the, um, I can't remember. Anyway, started the women's suffrage movement. And they think, ah, at least we'll have the right to vote. 1850s, big deal. It took another 70 years after that before the 19th Amendment finally gave women the right to vote in 1920. So that's something we had a major problem with trying to resolve in our Constitution. Didn't resolve it until the 1920s, did we? It's about 220 years since yeah. the Constitution was ratified. Yeah. And how, how would you say that their, their ideas and actions are affecting America today? Oh, every day. Every day we, the newspapers are full of arguments about the Bill of Rights, the Constitution itself. Uh, in fact, the most recent one is after the, the health care plan was chosen, or pardon me, was passed, uh, then states started suing the federal government. And uh, the last I heard, there were like 15 or 16 states that had sued the federal government because they said that's a violation of the Tenth Amendment, federal rights over states' rights. No, we want equal rights here. Uh, the feds do not have, should not have the power, according to the Tenth Amendment, this is their argument now, should not have the power to tell someone, a citizen, living in a colony, that you have to buy something, and if you don't buy it, we're going to fine you. So that's why all these states are suing the federal government. That's happening today. Take a look at the freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Remember a few years ago when all those students were organized at the University of California campus, and they lived up in the trees for about three years? Yeah. <laughs> right. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. We argued every day. All the TV stations in the Bay Area covered that constantly. Uh, we have some... Oh, th look what happened 
in January. The Supreme Court, five to four vote. This is the one, the corporations contributing dollars, they had the freedom of speech to do that. And isn't that interesting? And now we're arguing about that. I mean, the president in the State of the Union message even criticized the Supreme Court, and they were sitting right there in Congress, <laughs> weren't they? And they didn't like it, but he did. So we argue constantly about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and all of our daily activities throughout the country. So those ideas of those founding fathers really inculcated, if you will, into the, into the Constitution and the Bill of Rights have an impact on us every single day. What actions should we be taking now to protect all these freedoms and rights for ourselves and our grandchildren? You know those knee-jerk reactions that we sometimes have? We hear somebody say something. We hear, for example, if you're a Republican and you hear George Bush say something, you will tend to think that's a pretty good idea, won't you? Because of your feelings about George Bush. Now, if you're an Obama fan and Obama were to say the same thing that Bush just said, well, you might like that idea because Obama said it based on your feelings about Obama. So I, have, I urge young people and all, all of us, whatever age we are, to avoid those knee-jerk reactions. Be smart. Judge an idea based on its merits rather than who said it and how you feel about them. Somebody makes a statement, whether it's political or whatever it happens to be, do they just make a loud boast or a claim without supporting it with evidence? Aha! Uh -huh. This happens a lot, doesn't it, in political campaigns. We think, wow, that's a great idea, but there's no evidence to support how they're going to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So make sure, no matter what age you are, you use evidence and are always looking for evidence to support statements made by somebody else. Also, let me caution you about news. I was in news a lot of years in television, and I was in it in the day, fortunately, when the great majority of us honored Edward R. Murrow. We tried to be as fair as possible, presenting both sides of a story. Well, today, in this day and age, many news operations mm -hmm. have political agendas. Right. Many networks now have political agendas. Mm -hmm. I have difficulty finding people that I can actually watch that I trust on the air. Mm -hmm. John King, for example, is a great one, I think. There are many others, believe me, but there are also a lot of them that I just laugh at. So if you read somebody that you really like, make sure you read somebody that you disagree exactly. with. Because that's, mm -hmm. as you get older, that's mm -hmm. it's when you begin to realize you really start mm -hmm. learning things, mm -hmm. don't you? So in other words, be smart as, as mm -hmm. much as you possibly can. When you turn 18, vote. And if you have young people in your family who are going to be 18, make sure they vote. And, and make sure they register also, first, when they're 18. Make sure they vote in every election, not just every four years when it's really popular, all right? Make sure that the young people you know get involved somehow in their schools, in their school politics, for that matter, or get involved in community activities, whatever, and then possibly in politics. When a supervisor decides to have a special meeting, make sure you go, because they're going to be talking about issues that affect you and your own particular neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been so informative and so interesting, and you make it fun. Thanks, Marilyn. I wish I'd had you for my teacher when I was in eighth oh. grade and oh. had to memorize uh, all the amendments and everything. It would have been more fun for me. It's been a pleasure for me to yeah. be here. Thanks, Fred. You bet. Take care.